Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of 1 Samuel. Tonight is study number 102. Now let me read 1 Samuel 6 and verse 19 and 20. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of Jehovah. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because Jehovah had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Jehovah God? And to whom shall he go up from us? Now in our last study we we saw how the men of Beth Shemesh dared to open up the ark. And, and uh, upon the ark was the mercy seat as a covering. And the mercy seat was the same dimensions as the ark. It was on top, so it would have had to have been lifted in order for them to look into the Ark of Jehovah. And we also saw in the book of Hebrews that God described the contents. The golden pot that had manna, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, the, the Ten Commandments written on stone. This is what they saw. The men of Beth Shemesh, as they looked into it for however long they had the the lid open and were able to inspect the contents, we were not told all of the circumstances and and exactly how things happen. You know, we we don't read they had the lid um, up for five minutes or five hours, and we we don't read that they they took out any of these things maybe we don't even know how many of them were involved could have been one man possibly could have been a group of men possibly or maybe numbers of them were streaming by as the lid was open we don't know we do know that they did this and god held them accountable for it they were responsible uh, and and the plague, or, or uh, we're supposing it was a plague. It doesn't say that. It just says that God smote them. Normally, God uses plagues to to uh, smite a people that have rebelled against him. And so the historical situation just gives us the statement that God smote them because they looked into the ark. But we know they had to have lifted the mercy seat and that's what we want to look at a little bit uh longer a little bit further uh and i think we'll understand why it is that god smote them and how this relates spiritually to judgment day as what has taken place is at the end of the seven month period the ark was in the land of the philistines and that seven month period completely identifies with the duration of the great tribulation so this is information teaching us about the end of the great tribulation period well let's go to first john chapter 2 and and we'll we'll read some scripture there and beginning in verse 1 it says my little children these things write i unto you that ye sin not and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now let me just comment that when God says that, it just means Christ is the only Savior, the Savior of all the elect who are found in the world throughout all the generations that God will save his people and Jesus the righteous by um, the righteousness of one by his obedience it says in Romans chapter 5 many are made righteous so God views his people as being righteous only because of what Christ did he is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he is the covering 
for our sin. He is the one. It, it also says in 1 John 4, verse 10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, there's a reason why we're looking at this word propitiation. It's not a common word at all in our English language. The two references here in 1 John are related, very closely related, to the same English word, but a slightly different Greek word in Romans chapter 3. That is, it's translated propitiation here too, but again in Strong's Concordance it's it's the very next number and it says in Romans 3 I'll begin reading in verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, these are glorious statements that wonderfully describe God's beautiful salvation plan. We can just go on and on and thanking God for all he has done for us, dirty, rotten sinners who have only broken the law of God again and again. And yet, through God's mercy, he developed a plan of salvation in which he has set forth the Lord Jesus Christ to be a propitiation, as it says in verse 25, it, through faith in his blood, his blood, his grace, and his righteousness. Notice how it's all, all of Jesus. It's none of man. And even the faith, the faith that saves is the faith of Christ. It, it is all to the glory of God, and we do nothing. It, if we added the slightest bit, if we thought we could, then we would pollute the gospel of the Bible, the gospel of great. But the reality is we do add nothing. It is the Lord Jesus and a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, this word propitiation, is only found one other place in the the Greek New Testament, and that is in Hebrews chapter 9. We read it, actually, a little earlier. In Hebrews 9, and uh, it was in our previous study, I think, it says in verse 4, which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Well, in verse 5, the word mercy seat is the same word translated as propitiation in Romans 3 verse 25 and and so there is a very definite and absolute identification that God makes between the propitiation the covering of sin and the mercy seat that was on the ark of God now this allows us because we we can't go wrong that since God is making this identification between these words, mercy seat and propitiation, it allows us to go back to the Old Testament. And wherever we find mercy seat, we 
can understand it is referring to Jesus' um, intercession, his, his work on behalf of his people as the substitute uh, for their sin. Uh, he is the, the mercy of God. He is the one that is covering over what? What, what did the mercy seat cover over? Well, it covered over the golden pot with manna. It covered over Aaron's rod that budded. And it um, and this is uh, really the the strong focus and emphasis of the ark of God because it was also called the ark of the covenant, the ark of the testimony. It covered over the tables of the covenant, the tables of stone in which God wrote the law of God. The law was in the ark of God. And isn't that our problem? That's the mankind's great predicament, that we were created in the image of God and and obligated, responsible, accountable to him to obey his commandments, to keep the law of God but we have broken the law and the penalty is very um, very plain no mistaking it Uh, whoever transgresses the law will die the wages of sin is death and and that is what the law of God demands and requires it's only the intercession of Christ the intercession of the Savior on behalf of those whose sins he paid for that permits God to be merciful. Without the Lord Jesus Christ interceding, without Christ entering between, being a daysman coming betwixt, to use the language of the book of Job, on behalf of those that have sinned against God, there would only be condemnation. There could be no mercy, no pardon of sin, no forgiveness of God. Now we, we can go back to 1 Samuel and we can see exactly what the spiritual significance is of this historical event that took place long ago when the ark returned out of the land of the Philistines. It was after seven months, a date that identifies with the end of the Great Tribulation. And and there's two main reasons we can pinpoint May 21, which was the end of the Great Tribulation, and that is the number of men killed, the totality of all the Israelites from the beginning of the battle, the beginning of the taking of the ark, and, and now the end of its return, the totality was about 84,000. Just as May 21 was the 8400th day of the period of God's judgment on the church, it was the day of transition to the judgment upon all the world. And so too... When the men of Beth Shemesh open up the ark of God at the end of seven months and, and so many of them die to reach that number of about 84,000, God is putting his finger on the date of May 21 and the end of the Great Tribulation, like this is the end of the seven months. And so these men, they lift the lid, the covering of the ark. What did they do? What did they do physically, literally? They lifted up the mercy seat that God had made to lay atop the law of God. They literally removed the covering made of gold, the mercy seat, but spiritually it was the removal of Christ the one that stood between, the only one that could stand between a sinner's death at the hands of an angry God and, and the law of God that would demand it. They, 
they moved aside. They lifted up. We, we're not sure uh, exactly how that mercy seat cover uh, could be could be removed. But however they did it, they now removed the that which stood between them and the law of God. And they were confronted face to face now. Man was confronted with the law. And and the law's requirements are very direct and, and absolute. You must die. And so God smote them. He smote them because that is what the law requires. That if you cannot uh, find a Savior, then you will die for your sin because you cannot keep my law perfectly. And now this is the significance is what happened? What have we learned from the Bible that took place on May 21? Well, it was the removal of the gospel lights that God had established in the world as the gospel was sent forth. The Lord uh, established his salvation through Christ. And we know that May 21, when Judgment Day began, from many other things in the Bible, was a day the door to heaven shut and the lights of the gospel were put out. And that means there was no more mercy. God uh, says in, in the epistle of James, he will have judgment without mercy. And judgment day is begun. And the action, the sinful action of these men of Beth Shemesh in lifting the ark's covering and removing the mercy seat was um, a, a historical happening that teaches us of God's removal of the Holy Spirit, of his salvation from the earth on the day of judgment, which took place at the end of the Great Tribulation. It really was a horrible, horrible thing, and, and physically, historically, but it pales in comparison to the awfulness of what took place when God did this, and it impacted all the earth uh, with over 7 billion people, alive upon the face of the earth. Now let's go to verse 20 uh, and read that in 1 Samuel 6. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Jehovah God, and to whom shall he go up from us? Now they're beginning to understand. Now they're realizing their transgression, their error, their impunity. In, in daring to do this. But notice the language. Notice this statement. Who is able to stand before this holy Jehovah God? That should sound very familiar to us. Let's look at a couple of places where this kind of language is used. One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. Turn to Malachi chapter 3 and in verse 2 and 3. It says, But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. And it goes on. But there the question is asked, Who shall stand when he appeareth? And that it, of course, is, is referring to the day of judgment. Now let's go to another place and we'll see just how perfectly this passage relates to 1 Samuel 6 and, and uh, the opening up of the ark. In Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, 
when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, right away we know what period is in view because of the description that this is happening and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon as blood and the stars fell. This is language that that relates to Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon not give its light, her light, and the stars shall fall. So that sets the timeline. We know it is referring to that which takes place immediately after the tribulation, and the tribulation ended on May 21. Just as what is taking place in 1 Samuel 6 is happening immediately after the seven months the ark was in the land of the Philistines. We have a spiritual connection. And it goes on to say in verse 14 of Revelation 6, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Now, uh, when, when God speaks of the darkening of the sun and the moon and the stars falling, well, those things are in the heavens. And it's all spiritual language. It's the Bible. The Bible that established the spiritual lights. It's the Word of God that, that tells us uh, of the Lord Jesus, who is likened to the sun, and the law of God, which is likened to the moon, and, and the believers, which are likened to the stars. It's the, the Bible itself, really, that lays out the spiritual heavens. And when Judgment Day come, or came, on that date, that we're, of course, familiar with, May 21, when Judgment Day came, here is how God describes it, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And the scroll is that which identifies with the Bible. The Bible was written on scrolls. And so the heaven was rolled up, rolled together, because the Bible, which established these spiritual lights in, in the heavens, as God uses this picture, is also removing them as the Bible is, um, is now rolled up in a sense and no longer shining the light into the world. Well, let's continue here. I'll read verse 14 again. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There is the identical statement that we find in First Samuel 6 verse 20. The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Jehovah God? And so we have an identification, um, a relationship with the spiritual setting. It's happening immediately after the tribulation. And we find the identical wording in uh, Revelation 6.17 that we have in 1 Samuel. It's another confirmation to us that we are understanding the events that have unfolded in that chapter correctly and it becomes another proof another evidence as we we found uh, in other places in the bible like in the book of esther and what what transpired on the 17th day of the second month to haman and so on and and many other things uh, from other passages of the Bible that have confirmed to us that Judgment Day did indeed begin. And the nature of that judgment is the end of salvation.